Hello, and welcome to the third session of the first day of the U.S. Ecomos Conference and Symposium. We are pleased to bring you this two-day conference focusing on critical issues for world heritage and social justice. This next session will feature three presentations from experts discussing the critical issues surrounding the interpretation of civil rights sites. The moderator for this session is Alan Spears, the Senior Director for Cultural Resources for the National Parks Conservation Association. He serves as NPCA's resident historian and leads the organization's work on defense of the National Heritage Area Program and the campaign to establish a Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Park site. So thank you for attending this session and I will now turn it over to Alan Spears. Doug, thank you so much. Um, NPCA, my organization has served as a leading voice of the American people on behalf of their national parks for over 100 years. Our mission is to protect and enhance America's national parks for current and future generations. And you can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website at www.npca.org. I wanna thank our hosts, U.S. ICOMOS, for putting together such an incredible panel this afternoon on the interpretation of civil rights history. And we are about to launch into three presentations that I think you will all find compelling. But first, I'd like to share this setup. By virtue of the sites it manages and the stories and the resources the agency protects and interprets, the National Park Service is one of the largest stewards of African American history in the United States. From Civil War to Civil Rights, our national parks tell the story of all Americans. And we're gonna hear about two of those sites this afternoon from the women who manage them. And then from our third guest, who will help us to better understand the role organizations such as the Park Service and individual citizens play in promoting and protecting the African American experience. Let me introduce to you now Dr. Judy Forte. From Civil War to Civil Rights, Dr. Judy Forte has more than 40 years experience with the National Park Service, beginning as a park ranger at Appomattox Courthouse National Historic Site in Virginia, to her current position as the superintendent at the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park in Atlanta, Georgia. As superintendent of MLK, she is responsible for directing park operations and mentoring local students. Dr. Forte earned a Bachelor of Science from a degree from Tuskegee University and is a Fellows graduate of Harvard University. And she has received numerous awards for her leadership and her dedicated service. Judy, please lead us out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Judy Forte, superintendent of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park, a unit of the National Park Service located in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. I'm thrilled to be on the call today and to have the opportunity to talk to you about the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park. The park was established because Dr. King remains one of the most influential Americans of the 20th century and is best known nationally and internationally for his leadership of the modern day civil rights movement and his effort to promote world peace and economic equality. Up to a million domestic and international visitors a year make a pilgrimage to Atlanta to in to understand and to tour the historical park. Our mission is to interpret Dr. King's life and legacy, and we do this by using the contributing features in the park. Those contributing features include his birth home and childhood home at 501 Auburn Avenue, a portion of his neighborhood, uh, and, which includes a 19, 1894 fire station, the King Center family home, the King Center complex that includes the entombment of Dr. And Mrs. King, Ebenezer Baptist Church, and the Masonic Lodge building that housed the first headquarters of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It is significant to note that this year marks 
the centennial celebration of the woman suffrage movement and women earning their right to vote in 1920. Although the 19th Amendment gave immediate enfranchise to a million of American women, the struggle continued for African-American women. However, in spite of the struggle, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, an African-American woman who was born in 1927, married to Martin Luther King Jr. in 1953, was an activist in her own right, made her own political statement and left her legacy in the United States with a multiracial, multi-ethnic, cross-class mass effort of a team that shared her vision for advancing her husband's dream for the future, she was able to garnish the support for the establishment of a national holiday and of course a national park in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The holiday is now observed across the country and in more than 100 nations worldwide. Through a philanthropist, Robert Smith generous donation and the National Park Foundation fundraising effort, the National Park Service was able to acquire Martin Luther King Jr.'s birth home at 501 Auburn Avenue, the place where he lived until he was 12 years old. And we also acquired his family home at 234 Sunset Avenue, the one that he and his wife Coretta purchased upon their return to Atlanta in 1965 to accommodate their growing family and to raise their four children, Yolanda, Dexter, Martin, and Bernice. Ironic, their decision to move into the Vine City community was in line with Dr. King's commitment to the second phase of the civil rights movement, which focused on addressing the universal injustices that plagued the working class poor. Vine City, which is where they lived, was a working class area that had a racial mix of working class black and white residents. And they also had the poor and disenfranchised from the early to mid 20th century. In the 1930s, the Auburn Avenue community had fallen into deep despair. Auburn Avenue, the street once known as one of the richest American streets, African American street in America was bustling with black businesses, banks, churches, restaurants, and entertainment. But now it was on the blink of deterioration. Many wealthy blacks that once lived in the community left and moved to the west side of Atlanta and they left behind shuttered businesses, homeless individuals and low income families. In 1967, the city of Atlanta slated the historic neighborhood for demolition. It was this year, a year before Dr. King's assassination that Ms. King realized the significance of that community and she called for its protection and preservation. Not only did her vision include the protection of Dr. King's birth home, but also of the neighborhood. Congressman John Lewis, who had always been a champion for preserving Dr. King's legacy and also to preserving other Atlanta landmarks to enhance visitor experiences and services at the park. In 2018, Congressman Lewis, through his awesome effort, the National Historic Site was designated a National Historical Park and the park boundary expanded to include the Masonic Lodge building that housed the first office of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. So lastly, I'd like to say your organization, International Council of Monuments and Sites, Efforts to identify and establish civil rights movements and sites as world heritage sites are commendable. These areas that we preserve and protect are sites of consciousness. The story of African American in the United States is multi generational, multicultural, and multifaceted. The rich histories and experiences of African American communities across the nation remain largely unexplored and too often not taught or shared widely. Your organization recognizes and values the increasingly urgent need for a national conversation and international designation that honors the resilience, innovation, and leadership of the African American community. 
it is time for us to give homage to the hundreds and thousands of ordinary people, both black and white, who helped move our nation to a higher plateau during the modern day civil rights movement. They shared the vision of freedom, justice, and peace articulated very well by Dr. King during that decade contributed to the development of a free and most just society today. Now, Dr. King did so much in his lifetime that promoted progress among us, the African-American community, the nation and the world. And his lasting legacy is evidence in the recognition that he has received after his death. The creation of the King Center, the establishment of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park in Atlanta, Georgia, and a national memorial in Washington, DC, He's the only private American citizen to be honored with a national holiday. My parents, at an early age, they showed me how to care about our earth and how important it is to love mankind. Dr. and Mrs. King showed me how a beloved community can be a fair, more just, and more equal society for everyone. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today. Judy, thank you so much. We're going to move next to uh, Dr. Joy Kennard. Uh, Dr. Joy Kennard holds a bachelor's degree in social work and sociology from Livingston College and a master of arts degree in history and a PhD in history with a minor in public history and Caribbean studies from Howard University. Go Bison! She has studied race and relations abroad in Canada, England, and France. Dr. Kennard's 20-year NPS career reflects an abiding interest in the preservation and advancement of stories pertinent to African-American and American heritage. She is the superintendent of the Central Alabama Civil Rights Sites, which includes the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site, the Tuskegee Institute National Historic Site, and the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail. Joy, take it away, please. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very happy to be sharing with you today in my presentation from the margins to the center, interpreting social justice in central Alabama's historic sites, historic civil rights sites. With over 422 national parks, which shares vast amounts of history, culture and natural resources through public lands, in our over 100 year old history, we have embraced the stories of the founding fathers like George Washington, great innovators like the Wright brothers and massive wonders of the world like the Grand Canyon. As the national parks tell our story, our history as a nation, it has been critical through the push of American historians like Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Dr. John Hope Franklin, and Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, that the story of the disenfranchised, marginalized, and neglected come to the forefront for a re-examination of a new American narrative. Today, I will share with you the sites in central Alabama that have moved from the margins into the central focus as sites that are iconic and show America how we have continued to triumph from the lens of stick to courage, and heroism. The sites I'm going to talk about today are the Tuskegee Institute National Historic Site, which encompasses the George Washington Carver Museum, the Oaks, which is Booker T. Washington's presidential home as the president of Tuskegee Institute, the um, Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site, uh, which encompasses Hangar 1, Hangar 2, as well as um, an airport that is active today. I will also share the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail with three centers in Lowndes County, Selma itself, and Montgomery, Alabama. And lastly, I will share 
Birmingham and Civil Rights National Monument, which encompasses the AG Gaston Motel, Freedom Riders National Monument, which encompasses the bus burning site of the Freedom Riders and the Greyhound bus station. George Washington Carver, as you know, um, or may have you, many of you may not, was a, a, a great innovator. And he is memorialized on the campus of Tuskegee University with a museum that honors him, which is part of our Tuskegee Institute National Historical Park. I'm sorry, National um, Historic Site. This museum looks at George Washington Carver as a scientist, inventor, a um, gardener, a um, uh, just a man who had so many different kinds of interests and skills. Um, we have his laboratory, which um, we look at as a, a place where George Washington Carver and his staff were able to revolutionize agriculture at Tuskegee Institute. They had a ton of farmers here in central Alabama that they used to teach different experiments to which were extremely successful, which are used in the United States today and throughout the world. Booker T. Washington's home, this presidential home is where Booker T. Washington lived with his wives and children um, while he was president of Tuskegee Institute, raising money, being a leader of leaders. His home was very extravagant, lavish, and today we do open it up for people to uh, go through. Uh, Booker T. Washington helped to sustain uh, educational infrastructure by teaching his students how to, to build buildings, as well as teaching them how to be self-sufficient, also knowing business, and being intellectuals. Tuskegee Airmen and National Historic Site is where we look at the great innovators, the Tuskegee Airmen, who fought in World War II and were destined for greatness. Uh, today at the Airmen site, we have the two hangars where the Tuskegee Airmen's uh, planes and um, uh, a lot of their training, their training academy actually is, um, is encompassed here in these uh, buildings that you, you see in this slide. And so there is still an active airport that we work with the city of um, Tuskegee in managing uh, that airport. And we also look at not just Tuskegee Airmen, but Tuskegee Air women who were um, aviators. The Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail is pretty much a, a amazing story. Uh, the pilgrimage across the Edmund Pettus Bridge happens every year. The Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail is a 54 mile trail that captures a movement of transform transformation by members of the Selma and Marion, Alabama community and is one of the greatest examples of transformative leadership. Uh, the people here in Selma went from Selma to Montgomery, Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, which took over seven days for them to actually walk from Selma to Montgomery to focus on issues of voter suppression. Dr. King was involved in the Selma to Montgomery uh, 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 walk. Uh, so was his wife. So were people like John Hope Franklin, John Lewis, Ralph Bunch. Um, leaders from all over the United States came to walk this walk because of their um, extreme interest in making a change and that change did occur. Here you see the Selma Interpretive Center, which is at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where we give tours and have exhibits about 
the Selma to Montgomery March. This is the Lounge Interpretive Center, where we also share information through exhibits about the Selma to Montgomery uh, March. And this is our newest visitor center at um, on Alabama State University's campus that will be opening um, soon. Uh, we actually had a soft opening in March, which also um, focuses on the students from all over the country that came and were involved in the Selma to Montgomery March. This is the Gaston uh, Motel in um, Birmingham, where a lot of civil rights activity occurred. Um, uh, Mr. Gaston was a very well-known businessman in Birmingham and Dr. King and uh, Ralph Abernathy and a ton of uh, men and women in the civil rights movement actually stayed here in this hotel when they were um, protesting and uh, planning civil rights uh, activities. The Freedom Riders National Monument is in Anniston, Alabama, and it looks at the civil rights actions through the Freedom Riders who came throughout, who, who traveled throughout the United States. And uh, the Anniston, Alabama site focuses on a bus burning, um, which also has a, a trailway station that is a, a national park. And so um, naturally, this is connected to um, all the things we do in Alabama to tell the civil rights story. We have a ton of partners that we work with. Uh, as I mentioned, Alabama State University, the city of Selma, Tuskegee University, Moultonfield Municipal Airport, the Red Tails Scholarship Foundation, the Friends of the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site. We also work with Sweet Home Alabama, which is the Alabama Tourism uh, Department here in the state. And we also work with other national parks. Uh, we even work with Judy Forte at the uh, Martin Luther King National Historical Park. And so um, this is pretty much the end of my presentation. I just um, am appreciative and thank you so much for allowing me to share. Joy, thank you so much for that presentation. We're gonna go next to uh, Sylvia Cyrus. Ms. Iris began her tenure as the executive director of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History in 2003. Under her tenure, which is the second longest serving executive director, uh, Ms. Cyrus leads the association um, whose mission is to promote research, preserve, interpret, and disseminate information about black life, history, and culture. Working with an organization with a national profile, she uses this platform fearlessly on behalf of ASALH and she has expanded Asala's community partnerships with established and emerging organizations. These strategic partnerships include the National Park Service and have heightened the awareness and role of the preservation of black history. Also need to share that the National Parks Conservation Association and the association are proud partners as well. Sylvia, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Alan, and thank you, Icomos, for the opportunity to present and spend a little time with you and uh, your conventioners today. I would like to begin by talking a little bit about ASALA and why it is important that our organization is a part of this conversation today. You may not have heard of us, but we've been around for 105 years, founded by the noted historian, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who's claim is the father of Black history. He was an innovator, uh, a product of enslaved parents. Dr. Woodson began his formal education at the age of 20 and went on to be the second African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard University. He was an innovator. At the time that Dr. Woodson began recognizing the fact that there was not scholarly information or very much printed and published about African-Americans other than the period of enslavement, he dedicated his life work to telling the story of African-Americans. 
And through that innovation and institution building, he formed the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which is now fondly referred to as ASALA, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. There is a national park site located in Washington, DC at the final home of ASALA on 9th Street in Washington, DC. We continue his legacy of speaking a fundamental truth to the world that Africans and people of African descent are makers of history and co-workers in what W.E.B. Du Bois called the kingdom of culture. Asala's mission is to create and disseminate knowledge about black history to be in short, the nexus between the ivory tower and the glo gl global public. We labor in the service of blacks and all humanity. Our organization is uniquely comprised of collaboration of academics, public historians, all disciplines of black studies and the general public and private sector. Our members membership includes a number of recipients of many prestigious awards, such as the National Humanities Medal, which was bestowed to our current president, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham of Harvard University. I will not take more time for my presentation to list all the prestigious members and award winners, but I would be remiss if it, I did not mention the notable institution builder, Dr. Lonnie Bunch, who was on today's program, who has been an active member of ASALA for over 30 years. Woodson was also the founding editor of the Journal of Negro History, now the Journal of African American History, a premier scholarly journal, the first of its kind, now in its 105th year. We are also, we boast, the largest Black History Month luncheon in the nation in February, and we bring together over 100 individuals to share in the Black History theme. We also have an annual conference that brings together professionals and students to present cutting edge research on all aspects of our history, but it focuses on the black history theme, which we establish each year. As Dr. Woodson was the founder of Negro History Week, we continue in that legacy. Quite appropriately, this year's black history theme for 2020 is African-Americans and the vote. And as you can see, the sites that you have heard about earlier by my colleagues also tie into this theme. We highlighted the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, and highlighted Black women organizations like Delta Sigma Theta, whose members marched in the suffrage march, the only African American organization allowed to do so. And you've heard from Dr. Forte that Coretta Scott King, who was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, was also a proponent of women's rights. We also highlighted the 16th Amendment, which gave Black men the right to vote. These individuals and stories are intricately, intricately tied to important sites that we must remember. Our Black History Bulletin, a publication started at the bequest of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, our first Black, our first woman president, is for teachers by teacher educators. The 78th volume, issue number two, is titled Hallowed Grounds, Sites of African American Memory. This was the theme for 2016, which was selected to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service, our largest and most important partner. The cover of this issue features Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma, the first AME Church in Alabama, and was the site of meetings to prepare for the march to Montgomery on March 7, 1965, a day that became known as Bloody Sunday. The role of the National Park Service is in preserving American history is the reason why we are such close partners. ASALA works with the Park Service to research, interpret, and promote sites and help train their staff. We are proud to say that we have helped 
rewrite some of the interpretations that make what our Americans and other visitors in national parks here more accurate. Consideration should be given to new sites as well, such as Black Lives Matter memorials that have been erected around this country to mark tragic racial injustice. Ferguson, Missouri, at the site of the shooting of Michael Brown, and in Louisville, Kentucky, where Breonna Taylor was murdered. The home and site of the assassination of Mississippi NAACP leader Medgar Evers. Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, the home of the Little Rock Nine site. The Bethune Council House, the first home of the National Council of Negro Women, Dr. Bethune's last home, and the place where Black women came to spearhead strategies and develop programs that advance the interests of African American women. Bringing attention to these sites creates important spaces where we can come together to discuss civil rights and racial justice. They create a space where friends group and other organizations come together to strengthen our communities and foster racial harmony. The sites that have been presented by my colleagues at the National Park Service are deserving of inclusion of the ICOMOS serial civil rights nominations, and we hope that you agree. Our goal is to support constituency building. There is a growing interest in civil rights and civil rights sites around this country and around the world. We encourage Americans and others to do more studies so that you understand what happened and why those sites are so important. We often say in our community, those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. The history that is included in these sites that you have heard about today helps develop plans that are important, not just to America, but to civil rights and racial justice around this world. So we encourage individuals to join organizations like ASALA, to support National Park Service sites, join friends group, state historical societies, so that we can help build the stories that make this the world that it is meant to be. To help build new future leaders like New Woodsons, Young Woodsons, and Bethunes, and Kings, and Lewises. Thank you. Sylvia, thank you for that presentation. Uh, Joy and Judy invite you to come back on video right now and we'll go into our conversation and our question and answers. And um, Sylvia, while we have you here, while the other folks are coming back to us, I wanna ask you a question. What was on Dr. Woodson's mind? What was his motivation back in 1915 when he started the Association for the Study of uh, Negro History? What was he trying to accomplish? Dr. Woodson realized that there was a great gap, a great hole in American history, that what was being told about uh, what was being pr promoted in terms of African Americans did not have didn't tell the right story. He knew that, they, that we had a history. He knew that there was a history of the people, the black people in America that went back to Africa and that came here. And so what he did was he said that he set out as a one person to write the stories of our history, to improve racial harmony, because he felt that so much of why America was having racial problems was because they did not know the contributions of African-Americans. And so he made that his life work. And Alan, my story in terms of Woodson is, he was also showing us the power of one. That if you get behind the truth and a story that you could change the world and that is exactly what he did. I wonder if it's worth asking if that's still a challenge for us today, a lack of awareness about African-American history and contributions. But we'll let that go for our, uh, maybe for another panel or another webinar. Um, Dr. Forte, wanted to come to you, please. And just to ask you, in your time at the Martin Luther King Jr. site, 
Have you learned one thing about Martin Luther King Jr. or discovered one thing about his history that surprised you that you didn't really understand was a part of the man's legacy? Thank you for asking me that question. You know, Dr. King, um, everyone thinks they know everything about Dr. King. I mean, I mean, he has been one of the, um, as the leader of the civil rights movement, you know, there's been so much research done on him and from the academia to the to school, to, to you know, grade schools, to uh, church organizations. So one of the things that, you know, as I started working there at the park, you know, I was like, what else is it to learn about Dr. King? And, and just some of the little small things, such as when he was born, his name was Michael. He, he was not born Martin Luther King. He was born Michael King after his father. And uh, at the age, uh, at the early age of 15, his father changed his name to Martin. And because Michael was born as a junior, his name also got changed as a, to Martin Luther. So many people don't, don't understand that, you know, that's something small, but it's, it's major because a lot of people think, oh, Martin Luther King has always been Martin Luther King, but actually he was, he was born Michael. Um, also, I found out that he, he failed in, in speaking. He wasn't a, in, in college, he got a failing grade in being a, an, a speaker and you would never think someone as an orator, great orator that he turned out to be that he would have failed um, public speaking, but he did. So, but he overcame those things, those barriers and eventually became the great man that he, he did to become the spokesperson for us all and to bring about change and not just in America, but in the world. So it's a lot of small things like that, that was very interesting to me to know that they don't teach you in the books, but we tell it when you come to the park and to the historical site. Well, I wanted to stick with you for a moment longer on that. I remember the first time that I visited your site and I walked out of Atlanta down Auburn Avenue and you get to a point where boom, there it is, Ebenezer Baptist Church, and it literally is a cornerstone in that community. Um, can you talk a little bit about Ebenezer Baptist Church and the role that it played um, as a young Martin Luther King would have grown up in that area and as his father was preaching there and the family connection to Ebenezer and what that meant to the community? Yes, Ebenezer was obviously the family spiritual home. His grandfather preached there, his father preached there, his mother um, died she was killed playing the organist as the organist there uh one sunday morning so uh ebenezer is is so much the family church dr king was baptized there uh he was raised there you know with his family uh after the Mo montgomery bus boycott uh, when he left dexter avenue baptist church there in montgomery he came back to Ebenezer, where his father was the pastor, the senior pastor at that time, and he became the co-pastor there with uh, his father. He's always been connected to that church. When he came back there in 65, um, he um, had meetings there. He was the founding president of the Southern Christian Leadership Council, the SCLC, which, as I mentioned earlier, is now part of the park. And so he um, been the founding president President, he had many of his meetings right there in the basement of Ebenezer, many of the strategic plans that the organization um, effort, planning efforts that the organization did took place there at Ebenezer. And of course, um, one of the most powerful event that took place there was after his assassination in 68, uh, his memorial service was there at Ebenezer and, and over 200,000 moaners came and to, to go into the church, try to get into the church to, um, to give him, uh, to, to recognize him uh, at the time of his memorial. And uh, of course, you know, his words was, I just wanted to be remembered, not of all the infamous things that people think that I am a great or, or orator, a great leader or any, I just want people to understand that, um, I love everyone basically. And my and that was my I don't have a drum major instinct. My drum major instinct is to to love everyone. So uh, after his service there at Ebenezer, the uh, they put him on a wagon 
a, a mule drawn wagon and then he went down to Morehouse College, uh, um, Morris Brown College, I'm sorry, for, um, for another funeral. So a lot of history of involving Dr. King and his family takes place there within the historical park at Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is the cornerstone of Auburn Avenue. Okay, Dr. Kennard wanted to come to you. I, just a question that popped into my mind as you were talking, and you've got the brand new visitor center uh, that had the soft opening in Montgomery. Is the Park Service collaborating in any way with Brian Stevenson and his National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is sometimes referred to as the lynching memorial? Just curious about that. Yes, well, we um, collaborate with uh, pretty much all of the museums in uh, downtown Montgomery. Uh, we have been um, eager to open, of course, COVID did kind of shut things down, but um, the Southern Poverty, Poverty, Poverty Leadership Center, um, just, you know, there the Rosa Parks Museum, I mean, there are so many different sites in uh, downtown Montgomery that we, we focus on uh, collaborating with. And um, actually in March, uh, we're planning uh, with the community, the Jubilee celebration, which is the scene crossing the bridge, which will be virtual this year. And so we definitely have a lot of collaborations, uh, not just with EJI um, and uh, Attorney Stevenson, but with um, most of the uh, sites in the um, civil rights trail in Montgomery, even Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which is about six blocks away from the uh, center um, because Dexter Avenue is not far away from Alabama State, which is the campus the center sits on. And Dr. King used to um, often come to the campus and meet with different professors and theologians and uh, Ralph Abernathy, whose uh, home isn't too far away from the center as well. It's a historic site designated um, here in, in Montgomery. And so uh, there's a large footprint of civil rights activity in Montgomery proper, and we're right in the hub of it. And so um, we definitely can't neglect those other entities that uh, tell the unique stories of the local and national civil rights story. So we, we do work with other entities. Now, I have been told in such a way to believe it that if you want to get a hotel room in Selma, you shouldn't try to do it in March unless you book two years ahead. So oh, every, no. Don't every worry. year, the Park Service and other partners do help to recreate that march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, have you done that walk? And what has that been like for you to retrace the steps of people like John Lewis and the other foot soldiers who went across that bridge on what became known as Bloody Sunday? I have not done that walk yet. I have, of course, been to Selma and worked with the city and worked with the um, uh, folks, it, it's kind of been weird because when I got the position, which has only been six months, um, COVID has been an issue. And so we've been meeting virtually. Of course, I got to really work with them when John Lewis passed away and there was a viewing um, of his body at uh, Brown Chapel. And so I worked with Congresswoman Sewell, the family of John Lewis, as well as um, other uh, civil rights leaders and folks in Alabama and uh, elected officials to uh, host that uh, community viewing of, of, of John Lewis uh, before he um, went to the U.S. Capitol and then to be funeralized at um, in Atlanta, uh, where you know Judy and her staff actually came down to help and support with that event. And um, and so we still plan on doing collaborative events with the community uh, in Selma, whether it be virtual or face-to-face -face in the future. Um, I think that 
being here and knowing what happened, it's an amazing feeling to be the keeper of the legacy. When you think about John Lewis and Dr. King and Amelia Boynton Robinson and um, Reverend Orange and C.T. Vivians and uh, Fred, uh, Dr. Reese, I mean, there's so much in me because my parents were civil rights leaders. Um, they were very active in sit-ins, in um, wait-ins, in uh, all kinds of protests. And, um, and so I heard growing up about all the things they did, meeting John Lewis, meeting Dr. King, uh, working with Jesse Jackson. And, and so uh, it just warms my heart to preserve that legacy I grew up hearing about um, here in this capacity. And so um, I wasn't able to meet John Lewis in this job capacity. I met him when I was a student at Howard University, um, signed his book and got a copy of uh, one of his books, but um, it just is an incredible feeling. And sometimes I have to just stop focusing on that and get my job done because the job is so personal um, when it comes to the things I have inherited from the work they did and the sacrifices they, they um, gave and the physical manifestation of the, the issues like being beaten and practicing nonviolence. Uh, it, it takes a higher level of intellectualism to even conceive all the things people went through to have a job here and you know be a federal executive like Judy. I mean, it, it's just compelling. And so I, I'm just thankful and um, look forward to continuing to do whatever I do to fight to make sure that their stories are told properly, comprehensively, and the right way. All right. Sylvia, we had a question um, from one of our viewers about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We know that history is always changing, historiography is changing, and there are folks out there that would like to see the name of that bridge change, perhaps even renamed for Congressman John Lewis. What are your thoughts on that, please? Well, well um, it's definitely a hot topic. I think that um, the city of Selma, the people in Selma and people around the country all have different opinions about um, your question. I think that John Lewis is deserving of a lot of different things um, as he has passed on. Um, and so I just really can't comment on how I feel about that because it's so uh, such a politically charged um, uh, situation with the renaming of the bridge. Got but it. I think that he definitely deserves to be remembered and he is um, being remembered in different ways and things that um, I've been involved in here in Alabama that will be coming to the fold soon. Okay. Sylvia, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I represent a host of historians uh, like our, our uh, two, my fellow panelists here. And I think there's something to be said in history being what it is. Um, I agree with uh, Joy, Dr. Kennard, that uh, John Lewis is certainly deserving of recognition for his, you know, what he represents and his legacy. Uh, but I can't say that personally, uh, that, that that renaming that bridge would be what I would recommend as how we remember John Lewis. Um, I think uh, there's, there has been a lot. And if you, you know, look at what is happening with the silo on our website, we've done a lot uh, in terms of monuments, there's been a lot of discussion around that these days. And we don't believe in revisionist history. 
the Edmund Pettus Bridge is what it was. It represented what it did. And, um, you know, history will come to, you know, to show what the powers that be who have the ability to make that decision will decide. But uh, for, for me personally, I think that the name of the bridge should remain the same. Um, and what it represents uh, will be there for future generations. Um, you know, bridges are not for forever. <laughs> so there's no, we cannot make an assumption that it's gonna be there forever. Uh, but in changing the name, I, I, I can't say that that would be one of the ways that I would think would be necessarily be the way that we would represent John Lewis. And I think that there is important historical context uh, in the name and maybe we should just consider leaving it the way that it is. Thank you for that. Uh, a question for all three of you as we begin to reach our time here for the end of this panel. But one of the uh, participants wants to know, how does the Park Service, how is Asala, how are you all commemorating the legacies of other towering civil rights figures, not named Martin Luther King or Booker T. Washington? Um, and maybe even how are you remembering the legacies and honoring commemorating the legacies of the foot soldiers, those people that um, their names might not ever wind up in a history book. Judy, we'll start with you, then go to Joy, then come to Sylvia. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question. I get that quite often being at Martin Luther King. It's like, well, it's not all about Martin Luther King, right? He was one of the, even though he was a great leader, you know, there were many other foot soldiers that brought about this change. And that is so true. Um, obviously, uh, Joy and I, we work within our enabling legislation. But I've been very fortunate uh, due to Congressman Lewis in 2018, we now own the uh, Masonic, not own, I'm sorry, the Masonic Lodge building is within the park boundary and we will be occupying the first uh, headquarters of SCLC and many of those foot soldiers, uh, Robin Abernathy, C.T. Vivian, uh, Congressman Lewis, many of those other foot soldiers stories will be told and they will be told out accurately out of their it rolled in the civil rights moving dealings, particularly in the organization in which they were a part of, which was the Southern Christian Leadership Council. So I'm looking forward to expanding our story, uh, being more inclusive and in telling the, the overall story of the movement and all the great foot soldiers whom we all shoulders whom we all stand on. So we are looking at that. Um, and there's other sites, particularly in Atlanta, um, the um, uh, uh, Reverend Abernathy's church there is one that we are currently um, considering to be included in the National Park Service. They're doing a study on it now, a research study. So the Park Service is constantly adding sites. And that's one uh, thing that I'm very proud of uh, being uh, working for the National Park Service is that they have expanded uh, the stories, which included adding additional African American sites that tell our stories and um, give us an opportunity to know there's other individuals besides Dr. Martin Luther King or Booker T. Washington or, or George Washington Carver, sort of the names that they always bring up when we talk about our African American history. But there are many, many, many other foot soldiers like Jose Williams and, and, and others that we don't talk enough about. Okay. Well, Joy, same question for you, but maybe um, two minutes for an answer, please. <laughs> so um, we have oral history pro, uh, projects that have recently been funded for two years that we um, have identified people in Selma, Lowndes County, and Montgomery that will be a part of an oral history project. We're planning on um, seeking uh, additional uh, support to have cultural resource uh, studies done so we can look at the attorneys that help with the Selma to Montgomery March. Uh, we can look at uh, the churches that are up and down the trail that uh, had different needs for the marchers and the campsites because the marchers actually live on the farms of people up and down the trail that exists today throughout the march which took seven days for them to walk to Montgomery. 
And so we're looking at those places, those landowners, those kinds of people who are lesser known. Dabney Montgomery, he was Dr. King's security guard when he walked to, um, when he was on the trail. He was a Tuskegee Airman. And we recognized him yesterday with a video on him on our Facebook page, which I hope um, the attendees can go look at. But uh, that's how we're working through looking at foot soldiers and recognizing those people who are lesser known. Joy, thank you for that. Sylvia, we're gonna give you the final word for the panel today on this question of recognizing the foot soldiers and some towering figures, but maybe not the superstars of the civil rights movement. Your thoughts on this? So I know I have six, I have uh, 30, 60 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, it's okay. The work of Asala is to do that research and our members write those books and do that research so that the stories of the lesser known individuals are told. Yes, uh, Clay Carson, Dr. Carson at Stanford University, the editor of the MLK uh, Junior Papers is one of our members, but we also have many members who write the stories of the Fred Shuttleworth and, and even those stories of names that you may not recognize. Um, the stories of the power of just individual people who are not well known is so important. It ties us to the history and it really helps us know that we as individuals can make this world a better place. We can, and there's so many great examples of it. So we just encourage people to join Asala, join organizations, become members of friends groups, really get active so that some of these stories can be told. And just as Joy has the pride in her site and, and um, Judy has the, the pride in her site, we have a collective pride in the history of America, the struggles, the, the triumphs, and I think that we should all engage it and do a better job of telling the stories of these other individuals. Sylvia, thank you so much. And I want to thank you all. We could have used two hours today. We could have used three hours today. Yes. And yes. we are unfortunately leaving some questions on the table unanswered for this webinar. But um, Destry, I promise you, we will continue to work on uh, Thurgood Marshall in Baltimore. So that's a given. Uh, Dr. Joy Kennard, Dr. Judy Ann Forte of the National Park Service, and my good, good friend, Ms. Sylvia Cyrus, the Executive Director for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Thank you all for that. I want to bring back Doug Comer at this point in time to close out the panel and uh, give you a few words. Uh, Doug, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That, that was a session about telling the stories that have too long not been told, and we have all been poor for that. I want to thank you all for joining us on this first day of the U.S. ICOMOS 2020 International Sympo Symposium and Conference, U.S. World Heritage and Social Justice in the 21st Century. This conference marks a turning point. This ICOMOS has long been a network that joins heritage professionals and advocates, architects, art historians, engineers, planners, archaeologists, heritage site managers, those involved with heritage in government and academia here and around the world. Over the past several years, it has become clear to us that together we share a moral responsibility. How we present the past charts the course for the future. We deny the future for those we leave out. When we ignore the links that have joined countries and cultures together, we break those links. We live today with the consequences, a world that increasingly demonizes differences instead of understanding and appreciating them. Therefore, we become more frightened of each other as technology brings us closer together. We fight and point fingers and build walls instead of working together to find solutions that must involve all of us to succeed. Our COVID-19 crisis is only one result of this. ICOMOS and U.S. ICOMOS today celebrates the differences in human groups instead of claiming superiority for some over others. Today we have heard about the role of monuments and sites in hindering or advancing that cause. Now tomorrow, in day two of our conference, we continue to examine how our concept of heritage and the role that it plays in shaping our future is evolving. 
many of the most prominent World Heritage Sites in the United States are inscribed as natural sites, including Grand Canyon, Yosemite Glacier, and many others. This has served to conceal the fact that these places were Native American homelands. Here again, heritage presented in historic context can point the way forward by presenting that relationship, including the mistreatment of these human groups, but also the wisdom that they brought to the stewardship of the land. Today, much of the West is burning because a host of decision makers forged ahead without heeding that wisdom. On December 19, 2020, we will hold our annual celebration of world heritage. In the past, we've been in person. This time it will be, of course, uh, virtual. But we will feature presentations by Deb, Representative Deb Halland, one of the first two Native American women elected to the US Congress and a member of the Laguna Pueblo people, and Irina Bokova, former Director General of UNESCO. We will also show greetings and video greetings from World Heritage Sites in the United States and around the world. Those who register will receive World Heritage travel chats full of items associated with World Heritage. We will then have a toast and a pledge to work together for a better world in the years ahead. So this year we ask for your support by registering for the celebration. There are many ticket options. And with that, I want to thank you all, Secretary Bunch, Director Stanton especially, but then all of our speakers and discussants, Rebecca Senior, Beatriz Gomez Diaz, Leonardo Castrillona, Kali Holloway, Wazi Apo, Brandon, Brandon Dillard, Pascal Turyunga, Judy Ann Forte, Joy Kennard, uh, Zoe C Cyrus. And I would also like to thank Nicole Urson, Le Olivia Likens, Kate Perry, and Zoe Long, our experts in Zoom technology who work behind the scenes. With that, have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Good night.